All right, well, we might get started um, just to kick off. Um, this kind of came about because we haven't scheduled anything else. Um, we talked to a few people over the last few days about like GPU related and adjacent topics that they wanted to talk about. Um, just yeah, uh, the two that have been, that's where we came up where we, people wanted to chat about moving the console into user space. Um, we were, we've talked about this previously a number of years and we've actually someone made on proof of concepts. So I think some other people have, I think the essential idea is we could turn off config VT and still run a full distribution on top of it, it would be quite nice for lots of reasons. Um, and what that entails, so we can get into that. The second one is a bar, more another long running, has over the years has been brought up is how to use, how we could get C groups into like the GPU space or how to use them for, you know, so far the consensus has always been like everyone, someone proposes something, it's way too complicated and they're asked to come back with a simpler thing and then nobody ever hears from them again. Um, you know, whether there's some way that we could bootstrap a small C group thing and work our way up as opposed to trying to come in. <coughs> but a lot of people seem to come in where your customer demand is and then doesn't want to scale to that, they just want to start there. And it's like, no, we can't really do that. It's not going to be, they generally have very specific to their hardware problems. And then AOB is just any other business. If anyone has any other things they'd like to add to the agenda, um, let me know. I can, yeah, if there's any other topics you want to discuss, uh, we can definitely add them to it. Um, so I suppose, yeah, we'll, we'll kick off with user space consoles. Uh, I would have you. It's probably one of the more. more. Yeah. Um, so the, the only reason is to completely disable complete VT is to have uh, a console because right now we need uh, only for FPCon to bind against a uh, uh, FPDev uh, device uh, for the console. And uh, so, yeah, the question is uh, how can we move forward to uh, have like a user space console and completely disable completely? Um, in Fedora, we already disabled all the drivers, um, but we are still uh, enable like the DRM, FPDev emulation, and also compatibilities if you have like a console. So uh, we were talking yesterday about what were like the basic pieces for this. And um, one thing that Daniel was mentioning that we should have something um, in the case that uh, the NRD, for example, uh, crashes and, and, and the user space console can, can start. So, so we need like a some sort of panic handler that will at least uh, output all the kernel log buffer, um, some sort of DRM log or DRM con. Um, and then the other question is, uh, which component will take care of this user space console? If, uh, there were. Um, oh, man, it's just both. This is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> And then stuck it in system D, and then decided to like become a goat farmer or something. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> 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 because, I mean, not the farmer part, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure we can like have system D as the only answer to that issue actually, because those. So historically speaking, we have a lot of FDCon devices that use. That are embedded devices and will want to that are using FBDev interface and so on, like on a regular basis. And I'm not sure System D is as used in like those oh, kind of embedded yeah. devices that they are on on desktops. And it's not only about a choice. Most of the time, they have like 16 megabytes of flash or something like that, and you just can't. Yeah. Yeah. But they can keep using config VT. Exactly, yeah. And 
Yeah, I'll take the when exactly when you when we will decide that the VDAV is just too much hassle and we will remove it. From the upstream kernel? Yeah. It's a, it's actually like the the hassle is not so much the FPDEF emulation because that's pretty simple, pretty clean, pretty reasonable locking. The real hassle is the, the console, which is dumpster file locking and full of CVEs, and there's pretty much no longer cares about fixing them. Yeah, but still, I mean, if we are discussing it, if we are discussing a user space console at the moment, it's because the console itself is useful. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, like, like Android, 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 they already killed it. Contiguity. They don't use it because they don't need a console. It's just that on, on kind of more traditional Linux desktop distros, people will probably scream pretty loud. <laughs> If we remove it, so that, that's why we need something in user space. But it's essentially, like the user space console is just a very, very thin composite that only runs the terminal. So, if you remove the background, what happened to that assistant? Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. David yeah. was uh, working on that, but uh, eventually came to the conclusion that it's a lot of work. <laughs> and he's just implementing GNOME's VT library, basically. Um, and he would have to deal with so much stuff with fonts and emojis and whatever else people want that he kind of came to the conclusion that maybe should just be the but I right? that he figured out maybe it should just be basically you know big like build of the way that stuff that GDM does and uh, that it come does and just come for the GDM to be on that shit. And at that point it wouldn't be necessity. But like it should be necessity. It should just be a project that is minimal. Yeah, which makes sense. So you would just have a built compositor built in running VTE in full screen mode, I suppose. No. Because, yeah, when you. Uh, hello? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, Neil. Yeah, somebody was saying in the back some words, but it sounded super mumbly. I don't actually know what they said, but it sounded like a lot of mumbling with the word systemd in it, so I don't actually know what was said. <laughs> Well, me. Which one? one? First one was one. First one was about the fact that about that we shouldn't do this in System D because yeah, there's like a lot of small systems that have. No, no, I, I didn't say that we shouldn't do it in System D. I said we, we should not. We are doing it in System D. We also have to take into account the fact that we probably need another option. Okay, yeah. So that we should have a second option ability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then then Leonard pretty much said that we shouldn't do it in System D because when David Herman dug into it, he realized you should just use GNOME VTE to widget and stick it in a compositor because when you're doing a console, everyone wants all the fancy features like emoji support and fonts and internationalization and... I mean, I want emoji. Yes. And accessibility and like... And all those, you know. all those things. You know, and I suppose that's the question is like, if we're going to uplift the world from FBCon, do they deserve emojis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, the world deserves emojis in the terminal. I have, seen people, I have seen people stick emojis into bloody system D unit files, and that does weird things to a normal terminal. I can tell you the system D source code is full of emojis. So. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good you know, is whether, uh, yeah, you, I think what Larry said is you're probably going to have to, and then are we going to have to have a KDE version? And. <laughs> Well, I mean, it shouldn't really have any, any UI, like... No, no, there should be no bug. No. You know, yeah, in all seriousness, it just needs to use a reasonably comprehensive graphical terminal emulator library and then just be done with it. I don't know if VTE counts as that, though, but... It's what we have, I think. <laughs> uh, and David was a bit sucked into this rabbit hole that... Uh, if you like just having a console is then also not enough because then you have to need to figure out the, like privileges because you probably want to run that the, that thing as the user that's actually locked in instead of some, some other user. And once you come into that thing, then you start thinking about GBM and the so these thing that you have a display manager before you start your terminal. Then you're just like, oh my god, this. He, he for a while he then figured out, oh my god, if we need now to do need to do authentication. Stuff, then, uh, also and then it was just, uh, so, <laughs> at some point, you're just recreating an entire desktop environment yeah, exactly. yeah. on the console. Yeah. Like, 
it seems like starting from first principles here, if you're trying to replace config VT, mostly you need what is the kernel interface to a VT that you don't get with a console, and how do we emulate that in user space? And that's mostly here's a stack of ioctals, and here's so, some devices with special names. So what he did basically, um, which it learns and works, is uh, uh, if you do not have a VT like on other displays, um, we have session switching and everything in place these days. So uh, um, I think if people randomly without config VT and it just works, except that there is no uh, channel that everybody accepts that just, just compositing and right. VT. But it seems like if there's enough of an emulation layer to give you like a dev TTY1, dev TTY2, like if you can pretend to be that and then you can support a handful of ioctals, then it seems like you're most of the way there and everything else is what do you decide to put on user space. So in, in, in terms of the VTA, uh, uh, like the first one is still special, right? Like TTY1, that's it, yeah. but TTY2 is special. But uh, um, we will have graceful fallbacks that, that's not available, but I'm not sure we should even try to pretend that the stupid runs in user space was a VT because there's so much API in this, uh, and in and you don't want to support those. I don't know. So, um, I think it's just a matter of somebody sitting down and writing, like doing the minimal compositing VT thing and then um, making people actually. Yeah. Like I see a lot of like where you yeah like how are you, how are you gonna do like login prompts on six different like emulate the six terminals with six different users and you start as root first and then have it respawn as the user when it logged in. Well, maybe maybe the answer to that is just not do that, right? Like, yeah, but that, 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 that just run it as user TTY. Or something well, like that. yeah. We're, the question, I suppose the question is, do we want to like as a distro? I suppose not. Uh, do distros want to have the exact same Feature set as we have, you know, interface that we have now is control alt F1 give you a login prompt, does control F2 give you a login prompt, you know, and if we want to do that, the consequences of using a GNOME library in a VT is going to be. Actually, was, if, if you look at, I did for the Flickr free, I did something called deferred FBCOM initialization, where the FBCOM doesn't actually bind to the, as itself as the console driver until the first text is output to a console. Which is just a hack to not get a beacon to destroy whatever's on the screen. Uh, and I notice at home that I, I, I log into GDM, or I boot to GDM, and beacon doesn't bind. I, I, I log into my Chrome session, and beacon, uh, there are complete sessions where I work an entire day, and a beacon never actually binds or comes up. So for the, the desktop workstation case, we don't really need the text VCs. I still use them sometimes as advanced user for debugging. But then I see in my DMS that the moment I do control alt F4, I have become binds and it doesn't come up before that. And if I never feel the need to switch to the text console, it doesn't come up at all. And I just run GDM and run session. It's only for code to images and for people. Uh, it's, well, it may be different for servers, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, with the requests we get insistently, like for example, uh, the fact that the classic console doesn't do Chinese and whatnot, and people are so upset about this that we don't care. And it's not the problem. I just think it's worth solving on the classic console. But uh, uh, people use that a lot. Um, and it's uh, the crowd that's been very great here. To right, right, right. So, so, but, but I, I think in, what I'm trying to say is we also need to keep different use cases in mind here, right? So, for the graphical desktop user, the, 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 the average laptop user, what you're shipping as Flora Workstation or Red Hat Workstation or, or running Ubuntu. Graphical version of Ubuntu, not the server version. Uh, they don't really need VT at all anymore. And we're almost at the point where we could even try to rip it out of the federal workstation. I mean, I'm not actually advocating for that, by the way. No, that, that would be great. But you do, you do sort of need a tiny little bit extra if you have config VTN, right? Like, it's OK for Chrome OS and Android, but. You know, stuff like MT has always had the secure attention key of you press control or delete and it throws you back to a trusted prompt. Without config VT, we don't have anything vaguely similar in the code. It doesn't really work, right? Like mm. the, the SAK thing doesn't yeah. really work. I mean, uh, I, I get what you're trying to say that we have control sys requests for debugging utilities and, and things, but it's at the moment, it's really not a security thing because, as uh, the graphical session can can delay the VT switch forever. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that API is horrible. I never want to deal with it as a compositor again. 
I mean, the second half in Keystone. Well, then maybe the then just let's just not have it anymore. Just kill it with fire and make the make the terminal graphical. Yeah. Like Windows does. So, who can guess where we'd start getting complaints from first if we just ripped it out of the door? <laughs> I, mean, I like the fact that I think it just needs a, a champion who does the DT composing thing, and then uh, Logan Lee should be mostly ready to just then make that work. Um, really? And I'm pretty sure there are going to be gaps to fill, but I think the, the, the big thing that's missing is that somebody sits down and writes the DT. Um, so, I, so, I think I'm definitely hearing that there's no point just recreating our current user console in our current FBCon level console and user space, we should go all in on this, not not, not half-ass it and just go, hey, we do that. Oh, go all in and do what you're doing, saying that needs someone to do that work. Well, I mean, what we learned, right, is that no one should be writing their own KMS stuff because it's not actually that easy. No one should be writing their own Turnbull emulators because it's not actually easy. Yes. And so what you get is you need to glue together full-screen BT thing on top of the full screen KMS thing. And we already have those two things that takes like five minutes. Um, I think the more interesting part is in the distro glue. Um, so yeah, someone from the distro side, if they could pick that up with like, you know, say a GDM and working with BlockMD in particular to come up with something exemplary, like all the bits are there. It's not hard to glue it together. It's just tiny. I mean, I've, I've put together something like that before for for uh, work stuff where, because I don't hate myself, I set it up to uh, create a graphical session that all it does is bootstrap, boot up a, a terminal prompt in full screen mode, and then we're done. And the added advantage there is that if somebody wants to start a graphical application from the terminal for reasons like a web browser to look up documentation, it actually works. <laughs> So what you're suggesting is using a lightweight Wayland compositor with just a libvte based terminal and call it done. Yeah. 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 Why not? What's wrong with that? Probably not. That's, that's <laughs> probably where we're going to have to go. I think. What about dependencies yeah. on servers? Like, I mean, the yeah. idea of like somebody wants a little lightweight server that doesn't have all the graphics UI, but is used to kind of get, being able to get onto a simple console. Um, for you know, you can build it without any dependencies on Mesa, LibGL, whatever. It's pretty tiny. Yeah, probably. you can do it unaccelerated if you hate yourself enough. <laughs> well, the constant, that's the question, question I was asking, but that standard console we have now is totally, you know, acceleration is, is lies. It's, it's, it's on acceleration. So, yeah, I mean, again, you just have to hate yourself enough, and then you, it's there. <laughs> well, if you hate yourself, or you're just debugging, you know, your graphics system right. crashed. Right, either you One hate yourself or something else hates you. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and that's what, that's what you would lose with, this, well, maybe sort of lose if, is if something tanks your GPU properly and then it's using your GPU to render your console, you have trouble logging in. I mean, yeah. At that point, like, how confident are we that if that happens, that the current mechanism actually gives you any help? No, that's the thing. I don't think most of the time you might you just type in the username and then it hangs trying to get to the authentication because some lock is taken. So that's well, I, I mean, just from a, a layman's point of view, because I'm just a kernel person, but I, I run a graphical KDE desktop, and, and sometimes something will go wrong with the graphics, and I'll pop over to one of those terminals and control whatever F something, and, uh, and those work. And then I can, you know, kill the graphics process, the, kill the entire desktop and restart it just to see if that is an, an issue. And this doesn't come up often, but it, it, it seems that if that were missing, that that's a hole. It, it, it's not a big deal, but it's a debugging hole that should be. Yeah, well, nice so like, a way I tend to think, so I'm, I'm going to just say up front, I'm a distro person and not really much of a kernel developer kind of thing. But one of the things that I've observed over the years is the perception that the desktop or the graphical stack doesn't need to be as resilient because we have that escape hatch. So if we don't have that escape hatch anymore, then the way people perceive how it how reliable the graphics stack has to be kind of changes. And so I, I'm not necessarily saying that you're wrong or anything. I, I, I agree with you because I use the escape hatch a bunch, but like one part of this kind of change means we need to consider the GPU part of the, the Linux system 
or the graphics stack in its entirety to be more important than it is now. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually okay with that. Yeah, I think most people yeah. probably take it should be that important. We just yeah, because if, if, if your graphical desktop yeah. is not up and running, but, unless you're in console mode. So. But I mean, graphical desktop doesn't require a GPU, right? So yeah. if you're on something slightly heavier, like you know, it does require GL, but we have software GL implementations that work really well. Um, yeah. If you're on a lighter weight environment like Western, which is obviously the best one, um, <laughs> you know, that's got a completely Builds without GL, never uses GL, all software composition, um, and you know, it's not setting the LAN speed record. But like you say, you don't need it. To be yeah. But that's what that. Case. But does that question as well? Do we just do we all? We suggest that distros pro, we provide that minimal software rendered only console yeah. experience, and that you know, yeah. if From somebody wants Western Pixman always full screen. Yes. Yeah. And like, Weston supports remote yeah. desktop too, so there's that, which seems to be the only compositor that can do it directly. Oh yeah. yeah. There are there are like ten different VT super super minimal zero chrome terminal emulators out there. Like this stuff already exists. Yeah. Like that like that way you should start well, I my worry about going into it with GDN with like all of the GL stack and all of the yeah. building like that is that for the cases like where you are on the crappy Server console, you know, it's just going to be slow or uh, slower than necessary. It's probably, I don't, but I don't know how optimized VTE is for, you know, rendering to the plain console. <laughs> rendering. I, I, well, it wouldn't be doing that, right? Like, could it just be lent, rendering into a local one um, and then passing that on the? Yeah, it pretty much be page flip to another copy. Well, yeah. yeah. Do you want to run memory requirements to do that as compared to what it is now? Um, it would be would be a little higher just because we we want to allocate double buffers. Okay. Um, what about file size and kernel? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head actually. Okay. Not really. No. Yeah, that's like for embedded systems. That's the concern. Yeah, like VTE is relatively heavyweight, but then you have to choose, you know, like when I'm saying there are people who want Chinese characters in the console, you have to choose between like, do you want that or do you want something which does no emoji and no CJK but is tiny? Uh, and I mean, if, if you go all the way and also disable FDF emulation, you drop the terminal and permanently allocate the frame buffer in the kernel. And then it would only be used by C3. So you actually go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you could start the whole, the whole uh, minimal Western PTE based terminal thingy on demand, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also for, when I think embedded system with no amount of RAM, I also think that there is usually no display output. It's yeah, a serial that's console. That's right. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're not going to throw away the serial console, right? This is not going to replace There, there are only like for people who have are actually a monitor or an LCD screen attached or and want output there. If you've got a display connector, I think, I think in serial, I'm kind of changing how I look at it again. I think it would be a mistake to completely lose all console capability. Uh, because that's a, it's an important gap that you'd be missing. In the, this is debug mentality. So your position could be, Yes, graphics has to work if there's graphics. You know, it has to be like Windows. It has to be super reliable. But if that fails, then you should go to a minimal thing. No one doesn't need Chinese fonts. It's a minimal console that allows you an engineer to go in and you know, right, get things up and running. But you're currently already, when you do Ctrl Alt F4, yes. you're already relying on kernel mode setting working. Right. We already okay. put the card in kernel mode. We're no longer talking with JCon. Uh, uh, and if you've got kernel mode setting working and, and, and you're Process A is still running and sees you with the special magic key attendant or however we're going to fix this. Might need some kernel help on the input side that we do, that the kernel can actually say like, yo, we need to start the emergency terminal now. Right. Uh, and give system D a signal for that, then system D could just fire up this pure software rendering thing. Yes. yes. And I mean, that should be reliable even if it's rendering Chinese fonts because it's always running the same code. It's not hardware dependent fonts, I mean, it's not dependent on kernel <laughs> version. This is pretty much what happens already, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, when you switch to TTV, TTY4, uh, what LogRD does is actually it starts a Getty on it, on demand, and if that uh, Getty start, uh, ends, then it starts a new one, right? Yeah. And you would basically really just replace that Getty with 
the other program that just brings the VP on screen. And if that dies, it's fine. Right. We'll be immediately restarted. Right. So I think that's a reasonable line. And also, like if if things get in the in the world right now, in the Wayland in the world that we have with Wayland or even to some extent X, if the environment if the system environment freezes because the graphical stack crashes, there's actually a pretty good chance you can't access anything else anyway. Like, yeah, well, that statement is not true as well. It uh, is true right now for anything that's using Wayland. Okay. okay. A lot of people are running X. You know, anybody, anybody, who's running, anybody who's running X with SysRec disabled, which has been the default for years, you're also screwed. But you know, not my like, experience. See like this, um, uh, uh, if you actually restart the whole graphics set stack every time basically this thing dies, you have a maybe a better chance to, to, that it actually works than right. is go to the, the VT back and forth, which is never reinitialized. But right now, we don't configure the graphical stack to restart itself on fault. We should, but we don't, because we somehow expect that people know how to access a terminal in the event that the graphical stack has crashed. That is not a safe assumption, and we really should change that. But if we decide to actually get rid of a terminal altogether, we absolutely have to change this. Yeah, right. yeah. So it depends on what we mean by the graphical stack. Do we mean like the KMS interface, or we mean like every single piece that goes all the way up to EVM? EVM has a million pieces that can go wrong, and if that goes wrong, then anything yeah. that it, it, it can be at the kernel level with KMS, it can be at the kernel level with GPU drivers, it can be at the user space level with GL, it could be with Vulkan, whatever. I don't actually care, and no nobody else does either. But if it fails and the user experiences things are stuck or locked, there needs to be a, a fault tolerant way to deal with it, and there currently isn't. Right. So, mm -hmm. well, that's not true currently. You have Control Alt F4, but that, as exactly. you mentioned, that's not fail proof. But I think we, the situation won't change. Actually, where you're currently at is when you do Control Alt F4, you require your either your X or your compositor to still be alive enough to tell the kernel it's okay to switch now because actually what happens is the either x or the compositor gets a signal we want to switch away from the terminal you need to clean up your graphics stuff save all your buffers and give me a signal it's okay to switch so as Neil was saying sometimes control the four does absolutely nothing because either x or the compositor is not is hanging in a loop or whatever doesn't respond to the kernel request give up your resources because the the the, 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 the vt1 the, the graphical session has a lock on the KMS, basically. We could even improve if we go to doing things all the way with KMS, where we actually have a, mag a magical P combo, which actually just kills, well, gives up the DRM master forcefully at the kernel level. Yeah. It's going to be very hairy. It might even be crashy in some cases. Uh, but it would be an improvement over where we are now, where if, if, if X or the compositor hangs and doesn't give up its lock on its DRM master rights, Control Alt F4 is absolutely completely dead. Right. So, and uh, the reason I know this is because I have debugged lots and lots of GDM and SDDM failures, and those cases are where you can't do anything when it gets stuck because right. nothing is set up yet. Well, I have, I've spent a lot of time in between where you know you, you can get away with this, and so I, I was like, yeah, you see it disappear entirely. Yeah, but you're not going to lose that. It's, it's, it's the worst case. It's going to be as it is now. So if we're just doing it the easy way, which will probably be for the first generation of this, mm -hmm. then we're still going to nicely ask the, the current DRM master, give up your DRM master rights so that the new thing can require its DRM master rights. Uh, and maybe once we have this in place, because we know we are going to do a full reunit, basically by running Western, we could even have an option where we allow a magic key combo to, to kill the current DRM master in a harder way, which would actually be an improvement. Well, can you already that a bit? Like, there's, if you get your um, your DRM your DRM file from LogMD, which everyone does, like it can already forcibly take it away from you, <laughs> um, which is really entertaining when random I your stuff returning the um, it, it can do that on paper, but does it ever do it in practice? I think so, yeah. So I think it's, it's like everybody. A five grace period, I think. If login D dies, definitely everything goes down with it. That's for sure. That's definitely for sure. Yes. Yeah, I think so, if everybody wrote down like 
what they call a debugging console method, we get like 10 different answers, yes. right? <laughs> and and that's probably okay. Like 10 is a reasonable number. We should yeah. just write those 10 things yeah. down and be like, all right, this is you know, we're going to pick five. Yeah. Oh, like, oh, yeah. oh, this, oh, this oh, is the workflow. Well, I also want to hear from so Javier, because yeah, you originally want this for an utter re you know, good safety. Other, you, know, you just want to get stuff out of the kernel. It's like, what do you think is what you need, minimum viable or versus practical, but like for your the use case? That's a question. I mean, I, maybe we can get away with just a funny handler and get the load buffer kernel. So, so yeah, we really need a like a console for debugging. But that's I don't know. So yeah, so the base a lot of people that are just doing graphical single things, just one is a panic handler effectively, and then the next step is then what do we do for the desktop people that want somewhere to be able to debug, or the server people who just want a console to log into. And well, from an edge point of view, it's like I often don't want anything. Yes, yeah, so, so edge devices would have, would have prefer not having any of this. Like, it's a means of compromising. Yeah, and so it's just like. You know, I don't want a console. I don't want anyone to be able to attempt to log in because, like, it's a, an attack vector. Well, you'd, and, you'd still like a panic handler you know, printout. Uh, another option is to have like a VRM, VRM con that would be like an in kernel like Epicon, but that probably we could replicate all the issues that we have with Epicon nowadays. So. Yeah, we don't get any of the advantages, yeah. like emojis. So about, about the panic handler, especially for the edge and, and the most cases, but also I'm just also just thinking about cases which I hit myself, my own debugging problems, is there are ways to, to don't like set, set apart some part of RAM and, and write the kernel up there. And currently, I know they exist. I have never used them, or I'm an experienced kernel developer and Linux user developer. Uh, wouldn't it be better to make that easier and have some way to have that work by default in most cases for, for the panics? Because I often have that my machine is so frozen that uh, uh, the kernel might have panicked, but it doesn't make it to the disk. So, so that problem is getting fixed. The trouble is that the panic handler dumps stuff line by line. Mm -hmm. And the VT console is completely broken from a locking point of view. So it sends out like your stuff to serial console if you set it up, then to P store, that's the memory mm -hmm. thing. And then it goes to VT if the first line VT blows up and the entire machine is dead. You get nothing. Ah. And Thomas Glexner and John Agnes from, from, from RT uh, real time, they're reworking that entire thing. So first it dumps everything to serial, then it dumps everything into P store, and then it dies in fire and VT. I, I love their confidence in the serial driver. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, having, having worked with said serial driver before, I don't know where this confidence comes from. <laughs> well, let's start, so, so start with V-Store, a dead serial, a dead V-Store. It's probably yeah. the last thing to fail. It really is. I've really yeah. died on the serial console for 20 years. And, and you, you, you could even in panic mode, the serial driver, when you enable early code, often, often has an interrupt disabled mode where it just pulls the, 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 the empty bit of the... The FIFO, you could also use that in this mode, and then it's going to be pretty reliable. So, so, so yeah, the, essentially disabling config VT is, is, should help that entire panic logging because config VT is just probably the main reason why panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that panic. But what I was talking about, Daniel, is, is not so much uh, fixing PStore and if node was broken. <laughs> what I was talking about is that PStore is so obscure that I, as an experienced developer, don't know how to use it. I can probably look it up and get it to work on my personal system. I guess it would, would be, be better nice if store. it's something which would work more by default, in maybe even in distro setups. Yeah, yeah. distro. Yeah. Yeah. But you know that system you have quite right? I like, can pick it up and put it somewhere. So. I don't know. It's, this is not well publicized. I, I don't mean, know. I know. Like my, my laptop doesn't have PStore, so. Uh, no, but there are P-Store workarounds where you just put like a Mac of top physical RAM in. I don't even know what P-Store is, and you keep saying this. <laughs> right, see, this is a that's the point. That's the, that's the point. P-Store is a method to basically save the last part of your DMS ring so that it survives your reboot. So that even if your machine is completely frozen, or preferably even if the power cycle, that's harder. The yeah. firmware. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> why, why are you saying that yeah, I can do P-Store without kernel support? You can do P-Store as long as you don't need to power cycle, but if you have like a reset button, then you guess, and, and you're, you don't tell your, your AEFI to clear your RAM after a reset, then you could have it at the top Mac of RAM, and then you can use it everywhere. 
There's a lot of ifs in that statement. Yes, there are. <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say is maybe it would be good if we're talking about panic handling and, and, and adding a per panic logging to 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 Venus to also maybe spend a day or whatever at looking at can we improve the default P store story because that would actually also people would wouldn't require to take a picture of the panic with their phone. Which is unreadable. Yeah. 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 That would definitely be nice. Not having to do that would be nice. Does Fedora actually enable that P store memory? Thank you. We have in the Fedora kernel the P store stuff is enabled, but I don't know what it how to use it at all. Right. I've never seen any hint that it works for me. <laughs> yeah. So for ARM systems, right? Like you can maybe like in the next system ready spec you can shove it in there. Um, but like for x86, I don't know that. Yeah. Um, it's. it's we have P store turn. I know at least for AMD, we've got P store as a kernel built in because it doesn't work as a module. Um, and I don't know anything about Intel, but we do have whatever P store stuff is in the kernel today turned on. But I don't know how to use it. I didn't even know what it did until you all just told me. I don't think it's integrated. In this so program. it's uh, disabled on Fedora x86, but it's enabled on Rel x86. Uh, <laughs> 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 x86 has from or Maybe you rely on KBAM. That's an option. Oh, maybe you rely on KBAM. That's an option. KDump with a minimal demessage pull. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, we use it a lot. Yeah. I don't know how to do KDump stuff. But like, the kernel is just easy that even rebooting won't be Some bugs are hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you if you will only rely on this door, you never give information to anyone. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing on screen to know that they even crashed or not. I'm back about Oh, it. right. Yeah, I'm not saying this would completely replace the, 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 the do a, a pay dump on the, do a, do a panic dump on the screen if possible. It would be nice to enhance that. Yeah, I'm just saying that it might mm. be I mean, an alternative in, in many use cases, and even a better alternative. Oh, yeah, to get to sure, yeah, but we have to provide a way, for example, when your, I don't know, any trauma is corrupted, how this is completely dead, uh, those kind of failure, we still have to have some way to Something on the screen, yes. You yes. Don't know. I mean, mm. yeah. That's actually actually one of the cases which I took into mind with the, the whole uh, deferred FPCon setup, that as soon as a single character is printed by the kernel to the console, despite quiet, it loads the FPCon. And does the, at least the Anitardy case is one which I tested, where I, well, I, I tested not being able to find the root file system. And then the setting will nicely print, even though the FPCon was. I think that's what the RM blog is going to have to be, though. I mean, like, you, yeah. like, you have P-Store, right? So Grub, ideally, Grub would have something that would detect P-Store's, like, previous dump. Yeah, yeah. And then it was a unclean shutdown. Yeah. Does it write, Grub can write, I mean, does Grub have any write facilities? Or, I don't know. No. I mean, you could, you can configure write facilities, <laughs> so you can just, like, literally write it somewhere, um, like, in you know, Actually, that's also, there's no reason Grub couldn't fairly easily write to at least like UEFI systems that have support for that. Yeah, or like Grub would pass a parameter into a file or something or somewhere in memory telling the kernel that, that oh, here's I'm, the P-Store from the last review. I'm actually thinking about Grub as the P-Store viewer. So yeah, that yeah, once yeah. a user knows the machine is dead and he cycles it, and yeah, Grub, you could. Grub then <laughs> sees like, oh, there is a dump, do you want me to show it? Yeah. But that's going back to the time that you can still touch the phone here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what's the, what would the idea of if the delta between a DRM log and a DRM con be? From, if we're going to go down this road. I mean, the you know, most obvious is a DRM con would be expected to support input. A yeah. DRM yeah. log, like, at yeah. most you might want the ability to scroll back. Sorry, and, very much so. Yeah. And that's, it also that's input though. <laughs> okay. no, so I'm saying at most. Yeah. Frankly, actually, I don't know to what extent we could get away with this, but the other alternative is encode information densely enough that you never need to scroll back. So for example, here's your QR code. Yeah, we've had that suggestion. Yeah. I like but, that suggestion. Um, too. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, Things are underestimating how much space you need. Yeah, QR sure. code is actually like less like usable than yes. displaying. Yeah, yeah. like it's like more on one screen. Yeah. I mean, I can I can show you how big the QR code is on my vaccinate European vaccination proof. It's like 
this. <laughs> and yeah. just test my name and my birth date and my no, social security number. No, it has a lot of data, to be honest. Yeah. It, it also has a, sig also that also has a signature, right? It has a signature. That's true. Yeah. 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 By the way, um, uh, if you actually go down this thing that we talked earlier with GT and stuff, uh, uh, there are a couple of users of the, of the APIs, of the GT APIs, that are outside of that part, which is like prior readers and things like that. So if you do this, these people will come after you. So you want to read readers and uh, uh, yeah, there is a point if you just take the stuff away. We need to talk to them. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So and that's kind of you raise the question what you'll actually end up with like screen readers and prior stuff that has to work with this stuff, so you're basically just starting up the whole job session eventually, right? Yes. Oh maybe maybe that can be made to work in a minimal Western setup. Yeah, actually, if you want to work with a screen reader, I think your the right answer is something that integrates with speech D and just doesn't bother going through the graphical. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just mentioning this. I'm yeah, yeah. No, idea. Like, no, I'm always wondering, like, no, I think you're what completely right. in NRD? Um, because, I mean, uh, these requests will be coming if people want us to embed the uh, prior reader and the screen reader and whatnot, and speech well, models and whatnot in the NRD, but just... <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got really upset requests <laughs> and, and uh, certainly good. And yeah. To actually support these but, things. but this is actually a good point about the DRM con versus DRM lock. The DRM lock would uh, also uh, uh, people said inputs, but input means means keyboard maps. Yeah. And uh, uh, doing a full console would also mean mean internationalization, whereas the kernel messages are all in English, so we just need uh, ASCII support. So I think we really need to go for the DRM lock and not for the DRM con. Yeah. But how, how would you then do the magic key presses and things like that? They, they, they don't even, they're just in the input layer and handle that. Yeah. Because those are not keyboard math independent usually, right? They use non math keys. I think they're already there mostly. I don't think sys requests. I don't think sys requests. I don't think that, yeah, it's, it's handled independently of. Oh, and, and if not, it shouldn't be too hard to move it to, uh, to, to the input subsystem. My input subsystem already does things like catch RF kill presses, which is ugly as hell, but it's there. I don't know if this is like a question for the session, or somebody would like to take the time afterwards offline, but like I exactly stepped on this situation, the control out that four was not working for me, and I'm sorry, I want to apologize to Leonard because like I, I tend like as many guys to put everything on system D as a whole, <laughs> so like I'm sorry about that. I would like to understand a bit more about this. So when did it stop to work and why? Because this is one of the frustrating things coming along right now. The, it, the it's, BT API is a disaster. It's never one. It's okay. all terrible. Just <laughs> <laughs> burn it down and kill it with fire. But it was working until like two years ago. <laughs> no, no, no. Nice. Yeah. Properly for a decade. To give you a more useful answer, it usually works, and usually when it doesn't work, either your X process is stuck, stuck in a loop, yeah. or your if you're running Wayland, your compositor is stuck in a loop, and as I said before, they, it owns the VT and it has it locked. It gets a signal from the kernel, please unlock it, it never responds to that signal, and that's why it's not working. It so you're looking for a bug in either your X server or your compositor, usually. It's always big. It's mostly just kind of fun lag. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, graphics cards crash a lot more now. I mean, it's still a deep doing that. <laughs> X, X could cause your graphics card to crash, before X didn't do anything like that. Now, like, the graphics card could hang out and it'd be like, it's then spinning, waiting for a fence in X, and you can't get the VT hand. And yeah, it's messed. Yeah. Well, I think we've killed user space consoles pretty well. Have you, have you got enough to even think about starting work? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alberto? <laughs> Yeah, that's why he's sitting behind you. I'm not behind you. <laughs> Maybe or or Daniel. Stop. Yeah, fine. Yeah, you've got you've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Proof of concept. It's just the disco glue and like the yeah. lock inside, like re-implementing the Getty and stuff. That's not really there, as far as I can tell. I mean, launching the terminal full screen, like using up all displays, would be pretty professionally embarrassed if I couldn't do that easily. <laughs> how about how about having a different user on each display? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll we'll take that one. And we'll see what we can do. On, okay, C groups. Uh, I don't know what I don't know what to say too much about this, but yes, yeah. <laughs> please. <laughs> so.
So I'll, I'll summarize where I think it's been. So we've had a few proposals from a few vendors for like a C groups uh, hooks for the AMD drivers. How the Intel have come up? I think ran the motors, and usually it gets to Tejan, and Tejan goes, "No way, that's way too complicated." Or start smaller, do something, do minimal. We want this on a lower side. You know, pick something really small and just give me a zero to a hundred value. Just and then the, we don't really get. Anyone that reappears again, it goes into obviously probably gets stuck in a vendor driver and they probably ship it on a bun too. And <laughs> everyone, you know, thinks that that solves the problem. Um, so I suppose the question is, well, has anyone ideas of what, you know, a target that is reasonable or something we, that, that could be useful but is not vendor specific? Like the big problem we have with the vendor specific is like compute units is standard what they come up with. It's like, well, we want to divide our compute units. You know, you don't use too much compute by any process, and then they go, well, this card is our cards have 64 of these units, and we divide them in this special way. And everyone else is like, well, we've got 256 of these units, and we divide them in this way. And it's like, there's no nice sliding thing that someone can, you know, it's all vendor, vendor, vendor. It's like, how do we, what can we come up with, or what, I'm going to say we. I'm not as but fall into this space. So other people people really want something in this space. How do we kick it off? How do we put a C group thing into the subsystem that is useful but is also very minimal that people will then work out how to So are you talking about like execution time enforcement there or memory? I think we should start yes, with something both. something tractable. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think people want everything. They want both. They want enforcement, they want yeah. accounting and enforcement. The question is do, can is that possible? And should we like why the one of them keeps aiming for the end because they've got a customer and they're like, this is what they need. And we're just doing that, and then we're not caring about. It. Can we start with something more like cross vendor? That's like, is memory tractable? And, yeah, 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 it's easier to start with memory. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's I think it's, it's better to find right, but even yeah. like but there's different types of memory too, and people care about different types of memory in different ways, and so then the problem becomes, how do you identify? A common way to identify what type of memory you're dealing with. That's that's the and then also you have to also integrate with the system memory side of things because you need your know, graphics cards will generally allocate a lot of system memory and you have to yeah. tie into that. So this is the the Grelic service problem, which is that Android allocates all its graphics okay. memory in a single process and then shovels it out. I, I thought there's a solution for that. Sorry? I thought there's a solution for that. Is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, well, what's the the magic service that you use on Android to pass stuff around. Binder. binder. Oh, yeah. binder. Yeah, I yeah. thought there was a binder I offered this and actually transferred the, 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 the charge. Oh, they did that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that, that's the series that I put out then. So it, it gets attributed to the process that actually receives the. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that, that problem was solved. Like, currently, I think you're in the bike shape of here, what you said. What's, it's what's the name with, with, with the naming of the different placements. Uh, yeah. But but I think like starting with memory and maybe just starting with accounting and not yet enforcement because enforcement with memory migration is another another entire kind of forms is probably the best way and once we have enforcement with memory you can maybe shame the GPU vendors into coming up with a standard for compute resources. Well, and one thing to watch out for is that you want to oversubscribe the GPU memory sometimes. So you want to let people allocate more memory, in, allocate more GPU memory than is installed on the card. Oh, you, you, you can usually do like multiple like enforcement. Like this is the hard limit, and you can get more if the others don't use more. And stuff like that. Yeah, uh, because I mean today that that works with our drivers. You can, you can allocate this big chunk of memory, and then it just leaks over into system memory. And of course, yeah, I mean. Or we're lacking secret limits on that, but I'm just saying, let's make sure that the limits don't prevent that use case. Oh yeah, I mean, this is why enforcement becomes tricky when you yeah, have migration, yes. <laughs> because you might want to migrate it to, to these kind of use cases, but then hit another enforcement limit, <coughs> then run into cases where everyone's stalled because you can't. Yeah, shop and, and the one of the questions that came up immediately was, well, if you can oversubscribe, well, what's what's the max amount? <laughs> and, and we don't even have an answer for that because we're like, well, I guess we should talk to the C groups guy before we, even, you know, try to answer that. We don't know. Uh, a lot of this is like to say, uh, the, the, the cloud orchestrator admins, whatever, like figure out what is the right maximum so that all their work will keep working without crashing. 
you can have several limits then, yeah, just yeah. like you're saying. Well, not uh, not that. Um, more like a uh, limit that's related to how much memory you have installed on the GPU, and then another limit related to yeah. how much more you can oversubscribe. Well, yeah. if people, yeah. people, people soft and hard, then it's too. It's people too mentioned many memory. Where I get <laughs> over before, I'm agreeing with the idea of an, an overcommit limit. Right. So, so I think that the way C groups usually solves it, you have like the hard limit at the bottom and the guaranteed lower. That that's kind of reserved for you. Yeah, the C group two docs have specific names for that. Yeah, just just memory high, high and memory low. Right. Right. Yeah. It's right. Nice. But with GPUs, what I would think that you would want is is like have memory tiers. So at least the GPU memory and system memory, and maybe even if there's like an HBM cache maybe. Part of that right. team, right. and then set a limit per tier. Like you can take so oh, yeah. much HPM I mean, and, so yeah. and, and so much GPU and so much system and that, memory. That's more granular than just soft and hard. Mm -hmm. and, 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 kind of and then your your system memory limit would basically be your total amount, right? So that 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 uh, that needs to always be bigger than your your GPU memory, right? Well, and unless you unless you want to swap out, <laughs> right? I mean, if you want to really oversubscribe and swap the disk. No, what I, what, what I mean is what I mean is that the lower tiers limits would, even if it's placed in HBM at the moment, it would still count all the lower tiers too, so that it can be swapped out without going over the lower limits. So for the accounting, when it's in the HBM cache, let's say we have three levels, um, and it would yeah. count both in the APM cache. And it will also be a reservation, at least in the two lower levels. That doesn't work because there's systems with more VRAM than system memory apparently. And vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So, so you you think this, 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 this makes the problem yeah. a lot easier, unfortunately. It makes the customer a lot unhappier. Yeah. So I don't think we, we can use this. To, this is essentially why enforcement is going to be a lot trickier than just accounting. And so I think first step, we should just do accounting. Which Actually, I, don't see you know. you, I, I agree with that. You, the accounting first, but it's also important to describe it correctly so that when you go into enforcement, it's actually possible. Uh, yeah, that's the hard part. But <laughs> right? I mean, if you can come up with good names for what the limits are, then enforcement will naturally be easier. Oh, the, the, the accounting doesn't have limits. The okay. accounting only tells you your current C group uses this much memory, that bucket, and this much in that bucket. But can't we have names for those things? Like you're using oh, this yeah. much of in them, you're using this yeah, yeah. much. I mean, that's, that's the naming question, the yeah. bucket. <laughs> OK, yeah, let's get the bike chip right. But, but wouldn't it just be better to just call it tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, so that if we ever insert an extra level of medium speed RAM, we just, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, they're not tired. They're, they're like more NUMA. A lot more NUMA. Yeah, now there's more NUMA. Like some kind of DMA hicks. <laughs> You have trolling there. <laughs> no, oh, well, no, no, there. That's, that's the thing. Not like the, there. the source of the memory. Like, do you care that it's from a heap, or do you care that it's um, a jump drive property? Like, how are there different names for those? I don't know. The accounting doesn't care. That, mm -hmm. that, neither does the enforcement, really. Unless you have some kind of like one bucket falling over into the next yeah. system, and that's when I think we might get in trouble. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, Numa is not that bad of a model. I mean, it really is. You know, how close are you to whatever processor we're talking about? This memory that's close to the GPU, this memory that's close oh, the to the GPU. I mean, it's, it's Numa on the GPU to look at multiple chips with your local right. interconnect, the bigger interconnects, and right. different writings to PCI buses and all that nonsense. Right. I mean, if you if you talk a really big data set, a set, a center. But, but that's what I'm saying. It, it, Numa seems like a reasonable model for that. Um, it's, it's definitely not just tired. It's, it's Which the memory accounting now doesn't take that into consideration. You just have high, low. Yeah. You know, like on this Numa node, you get this much memory. That doesn't make sense. Ah, okay. Yeah, we're missing something there. How um, come? So, so, so maybe the, the, the high performance compute people first need to figure out how to do limits on Numa. I just copy the results. I haven't paid enough close attention there. I thought that there must be for I, I, limits. That's weird. I could be wildly wrong. Uh, I don't think it's in our configuration. Table. I'd have to go double check. So we're pretty much also. I suppose the other question is so who's like. Where is there going to be interest in getting this done? Who's, who can we? We, we care. UK, yeah. <laughs> we, we care. And I, I, uh, think, I think there's people that care as well. We need to try and identify people in these companies. 
know, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, at least for the academy side. But yeah, I think the main the main question that I that I have is like, what again, back to the naming, like, how do we want to um, under under what names do we want to perform this accounting for this, this, this different type of memory? Um, right now, the, the series that I have allows you to specify any name that you want, and so you know, that means we're probably going to have a hundred different names. And that's, I mean, I don't feel like that's going to. Yeah, we, we need some standard. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but the vendors don't even agree to be on this view. We, we, we had something similar with a completely unrelated topic, which is uh, called platform profiles, which is like your laptop can either be in balanced mode or in performance mode. But then some vendors have a low power and a quiet mode, but they're not the same. Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, uh, what we did, we made an enum. We said you're allowed to extend the enum, but only if what you have doesn't fit in an already defined one. And we just wrote that down as part of the whole API box for how to get your changes upstream. Like if you if you want to add a platform driver and you really need a new mode, it's allowed. But otherwise, you need to pick one of the standard ones. So we we could have something like in the enum HPM cache. And then, or just HPM and GPU local memory, and just pick a couple of standard reasonable things now. And if something new comes along, you extend the enum. And there's also, of course, an enum to stream function somewhere for printing and for maybe the names and sysvs. So I guess you're saying that there's there's numbered levels, and you can assign a name to each one. Yeah. But we don't let the driver just pick the Yes, but, so. but the number doesn't have a meaning in 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 slow to pass or whatever. It's just an enum. It doesn't have a oh have a but if you if you went a step further and say, well, you know, level one, level two, level three, where and then you explain level one is closest to your to your compute processor. Then that would probably be something separate from the names. You would yeah, have, yeah. have separate you could name each one however you wanted, perhaps. And, but and, and the concept of a level might help because that would be a standard. No, I think we've learned one thing is that we never let people name things whatever they want. It always goes wrong. <laughs> yes, I guess yes. you could just that's, leave, that's name, much you could <laughs> leave it as level one is the name then. Uh, I, yeah, I but we, like we, that, we but just mentioned with Numa, you have multiple level ones. Yeah. Right? And multiple level one RAM groups. Like you also have the even like dual GPUs even on even on memory. even on GPUs, right? So you you got your video local memory, but you've also got system memory that's right combined and system memory that's system memory. Do you want to distinguish between yeah. those two? Yeah. And you also have a, a, like a integrated graphics where you might have system memory that's pretending to be video memory. Right. And then system memory that's right combined access and system memory that's straight access where you want to limit each of those separately. I think yeah, yeah you go down I, that road. Yeah, two but they're all at the same level. Like they're all just system memory. They're all on the same connection. They're just but the way the system architecture is they're split up in the hardware paths that go to them. But right. they're not really tiered in any way. They're all equally the same thing. There is there's different access patterns. The speeds are different depending on what way you are you're going. But right. And that's and I mean the the, but the hierarchy make doesn't that exist. Know exactly what is where, but in the end, you still have two main things: you have video memory and you have system memory. Yeah. Right. So we can start there. Yeah, like we're going to always have some. Well, actually, yeah, we've got our weird cases where we've got stolen memories and other mm -hmm. but yeah, well, the, the, the basics are well, local. Bring in more options. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I would suggest taking, you know, a simple proposal to the honest and take it, and yeah, know, we should build it out from there. Like, yeah, I would expect them to, if a couple of vendors are on board, uh, to be reasonable. Yeah, yeah, we just have people that didn't understand. Sorry, I'm not the rank person, but we in our subsystem of the make a very similar discussion years ago. Because every hardware device is different in, on, in our world, and we try to find something something similar in commonality between them. So what we did, we decided so we have device memory. So we don't care how device specific will will uh, will participate parties uh, will divide its its own memory, but uh, this limit it's for him because you you have it it gives us two things. First thing, first thing, very, very simple, uh, to configure from user perspective. Because if user has 10 nodes of different memories, which interconnected, he have no choice to. He have no, no, no way to configure it properly. 
he, he will he, he probably will find something on the internet and will put it in my program. But when I have only one node, it's much easier. Uh, of course, it doesn't fit all the cases, but it fits uh, general general case of orchestration very well. Uh, second thing, uh, like I said, it's all everything interconnected. In our world, when you have many objects, QP takes specific amount of device memory, memory region takes another, another, another device memory, and user didn't know how much actually they will consume for very specific workloads. So by giving some one, 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 uh, one number, they easily found it much, much, much easier for them was to find found pro proper number. And system memory was configured by C group, by general C group memory management. We didn't, we didn't touch because how we present RDMA, RDMA devices, so we configured only RDMA related properties. And, and this is one property. Second property which we exposed, we said, okay, we don't, we have many objects and different objects. And again, we don't want to go to our users because our users, it's, people who write application, but uh, we receive this setups from their system administrators and these two different groups of people who never never talk each other in our, especially in C group world. C group are coming from system administrator. So we said, okay, we will give objects, number of objects. Uh, this specific C group will have only 100 objects, uh, 200 objects, doesn't matter. So when application starts, it's we start to track every object what he, what the user tried to allocate or try to create, and so if he achieved number of object, or so if he if he get up to number of objects, C group started to 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 limit it. So only only two things, and we also decided in our staff system if someone from vendor will come with proper explanation why he needs to extend this group limits to anything else, we will we will continue. It's already three or four years yeah. no one came on. Okay, so what that. I'm taking away from that is that if we said for this problem, we're just gonna just we're we're gonna say we have device memory and you can put limits on device memory. Mm -hmm. There's also there's already limits on system memory. That's a good starting point. Yep. It sounds it's, it's, also better, it's a little better than VRAM because remember the PyTorch case is yeah, not yeah. VRAM. So maybe just device memory. It's, like, um, it's, it's certainly a, a great start. Yeah, yeah, and you can refine it from there. Yeah, you can refine. Someone will come. Proper use case. Yeah, exactly. You will, add, you will add extra memory if you need, but uh, everything is interconnected. You cannot, you cannot connect. You cannot, you cannot disconnect one type of memory from another. Yeah. Daniel, you might remember this more better. Um, how how would like uh, the gem paths interact with like the system memory C grouping rather than with the specific you know especially on integrated graphics where everything is system memory. Yeah. There is no. I mean, we'll, we'll we discuss this. The, the, this is kind of why we we are on the track. I mean, currently most GPU memory is in fact in the system. Secret. Yeah. The answer is not. Is not. Right. And and with Android and I think Chrome OS also, they, they want to like know like what's what's our GPU memory usage kind of separate from just general system memory. Yeah. So yeah. I, I guess just because that's the main user, it's kind of interesting to know whether you're leaking like mm. the, the GPU memory or, or just general other memory. Like when you have a graphical application, it's probably the first question. And so, so what he kind of discussed was yeah. that we, we track the system memory separately. So this makes like system memory. So, so and then there's maybe system. some very odd use cases, like with, with the DMA belt heaps. If it's just system memory, then it's just system memory. But there's some special ones, like the CMA ones, where you only have like a small chunk of your system memory, which really is like separate. And you, yeah. Kind Once I can't, it separately, maybe enforce it separately so that some rogue application yeah. can't just like allocate everything and no one can display it. Right. 
Is there a way to divide that up so you've got the CMA system memory? For yeah, it's essentially like stolen on, on, awesome. or, or, or VRAM from a functional point of view. It's like scan it needs, needs contiguous memory. But yeah, I, would, I mean, from a C-group point of view, is there a way to easily handle that case so that you can put a limit on the CMA memory versus the general system memory? Yeah, yeah. you expect some C-group for CMA, and don't expect that the G GRM will count CMA area for, for itself, because we also can use CMA and the different subsystem. I don't see why. Well, I mean, it seems like it would be good, good to have C-group support for, G uh, for CMA. I don't kind of agree with you separately from, from this, because whoever pops up and says, I want to use CMA, it's an extremely limited resource. Uh, you probably want to coordinate that with the C group. If it's, it may already be there, I'm not sure of it, but if it's not, that's totally reasonable, I think. But that kind of comes down to the same problem that we were trying to, so if you've got system RAM, uh, that's like your mallocs and stuff in your program. But then you've also got your GPU using system RAM for objects. Now, granted, it's the same resource, but do you want to allocate them in different ways? Because they are very different uses. You, you, know, you I would. I mean, you've got device memory. That's a distinct thing. Yeah, it's the, the blurry boundary. You got system memory, but then the, the CMA thing seems like a, a, an important subcategory because you can use it up and. and but what is CMA is usually used for for frame buffers, and I know some some things like uh, uh, video, uh, uh, video hardware video codecs need CMA. Uh, but what's usually done, what I've seen at least, is that the drivers just grab this at probe time once. So either your your setup works. Mm. Or, or it doesn't work pretty much, right? So it's not dynamic. It's not dynamic, so there's also not a whole lot reason to put to do all this complicated stuff of C group tracking. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, the is yeah. that the CMA uses that ready to go full dynamic. But in the worst case, it's probably not. Yeah. And, and my camera on, uh, it, on Android, will be yeah. on camera startup. I see. So it's just treated like a carve out and then you just ignore. Well, well I mean, no, 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 it's dynamic. It's dynamic. Yeah. 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 Most of the allocation comes through the CMA uh, DNA buff heap, and so that's kind of the way that they channel most of the. So it is uh, actually yeah. more dynamic than I think it is. That's oh yeah, it's a lot more dynamic. People are saying, okay, never mind. Some people have used CMA to allocate huge pages reliably. Uh, so that's also <laughs> of course they have. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> the, from the Android perspective, it's sort of an aspect that we want to be able to know what drivers, I think, more than maybe the devices, um, we're allocating through. And so that's kind of the aspect of like, you know, okay, if it's mm -hmm. this, you know, drivers providing them, you know, as much, we're able to kind of bound that and, and that and kind of have that accounting. Mm -hmm. Uh, on you know, where those allocations are coming from. Is that actually yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm not going against you. No, no, no. The other thing is that Android also has a HAL dedicated to, to tracking memory called NetTrack. So Android has accounting for all the various types of memory that can be allocated for graphics buffers. Um, so maybe you need something like that. You know, and that reminds me of the. Oh, sorry, I don't know. I was just, it reminds me that the Android um, story there was interesting because at one point they said, you know what, we need uh, named uh, anonymous, I love that, <laughs> memory areas, right? And I don't know if it went in or not, but they made a very good case for it. And there was all these many, many names. Yeah, it's, it's upstream. It's upstream? Yeah, so there's all these names, and, and it goes kind of a little against what you would think. You would think, oh, no, we can have common names and but they said, no, we've been doing this for years, and we've got a zillion names, but they're actually all standardized by uh, by the fact they've been around for a while, and so the upper level tools all know what they are, and we're good. So that's kind of an argument for saying, well, we could have a, any number of memory regions and let, let them be named however. But it's a UAPI that you have to connect to, right? Those right, right. right. At some point, you have to lock it down. Which and they basically again, the problem with this for something like C groups is like, you, you then have the cutting and pasting a policy I found on the internet because I don't understand this. <laughs> it's like once it goes past 
one, two, three values it's getting into. Why am I configuring ten different memory types? Like, is what's the value in it from a system administrator's point of view, or even a, yeah. Yeah. It's better off to give them one slider that does <laughs> not eighty percent of the job, and job to give them, the yeah, or ten buttons that they just don't understand. They're just cutting and pasting and stuff. Yeah, it doesn't make sense why CMA is so so special in 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 the RM world. In mm -hmm. CMA, it's it's common resource. So if yeah. you want to count CMA, count it uh, CMA globally. CMA, yeah. Well, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. It should be a, uh, because something else. Yeah, so you that, should count yeah. only uh, only things of your PCP for your for your subsystem. Yeah. yeah, but today you yeah. Okay, it's okay. You can, you can extend it. It's not a big deal. I suppose I think what system RAM is going to be the tricky one, I think, because of that. <laughs> yeah. Some people that are just running an application, running malloc, aren't, they're not expecting that. Again, yeah, because it'll depend. If you run a graphics card which has video RAM, and you run an application that's doing all the memory allocations, and then it does some video RAM allocations, mm -hmm. your system memory isn't going to be used. But if you're on an integrated graphics system, and all of a sudden it's pulling all your system memory out, you know, do you want to count that with all the malloking it's doing, or should you have that as a special? This is the video card screwing over, eating all your video. That's the driver memory. writer's decision, and we got to guide them on on helping get it right. But I, I think if you just say you've got device memory and you've got system memory, that's a good starting. No, point. but I mean from the point of view of the C group, is, is are you doing that? So if we have a GPU C group man, you know, manager, web resource manager, is it doing system RAM, or are we leaving that to the CPU side? C group stuff that we already oh, so have. I was, a GPU C group. I was thinking more of a, a C group that covers memory that's on GPU. Oh, so a memory track, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but device memory C group. But then you wouldn't have it at all for integrated devices. Well, I mean, if, if if some device has its own memory, then that memory counts as device memory. If it doesn't, then it counts against system memory. So we should integrate into our current memory. Yeah. Controller, not having it as a set one. And that's like I don't. I actually don't know if we even do that at the moment. I don't think I'm objects sure. allocated on sure. the graphics card are anywhere near that because it would blow out people. Because people when they design applications and put a memory C group around it, they're normally only considering the application's malloc memory, the stuff that the mem because you know, right. they're only doing it for the application. Because they're not considering that they're going to deploy it on. Oh, one day I've got it deployed in a video RAM system and it's using 100 megs of RAM. And then I deploy it on an integrated system. It's now using a gig of RAM. Right, but but that's because we haven't provided it yet. So this this is all new for them. No, no, but it, we have provided it for for CPU memory. We, like but people, not device memory. There is no, no, I'm saying, but they don't care about that. They're right. <laughs> they don't care about that at the moment. But I right, yeah. say, but I say, I'm, write, I'm writing an app, Firefox, and it's it's running on my laptop, and it's like you will use 100 megs. And I deploy that as a standard desktop thing across my organization. I'll say it, we'll limit the Firefox on all these laptops. Now, one person has an integrated graphics laptop, and one person has a discrete graphics laptop. And they get the 100 meg limit, and on the integrated graphics laptop, it will explode because the first time it allocates a GPU object, it will use all its 100 megs. But they only told about. Right. So by adding all that device memory that's actually system memory in disguise into the standard C group of CPU side, you are destroying I, I, an assumption they've already made. I understand, but you're not really breaking anything yet because we're going to roll this out as first. We're going to do accounting, and then we'll get people used to the idea of you have device memory and you have system memory. Where are they? And then we start putting in the limits. No, no, say, but oh, say, no, 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 you haven't gone to the step yeah, where I'm saying is if we do system memory under the current CPU memory controller we have, which has enforcement as far as I know, mm -hmm. this will blow up. Yeah. Existing systems. But maybe we can even do that because it would be changing the semantics of the current controller, and it might be. You're you're taking like, you're taking it away, like you're taking an implementation implementation detail of graphics cards, and causing applications to see that. Yeah, but it's been an implementation detail. They are using actual system memory. They are. They yeah. should be accounted mm. for. It's, it's, it's no different when you have two laptops, one with yeah. one gigabyte and the number of two gigabytes. Yeah. If you do a set C group uh, limit to two gigabytes, it won't work on uh, yeah, the right. application will consume two gigabytes. It wouldn't work on the old laptop uh, with one gigabyte. I, I would take this up to Johannes and see what he has to yeah. say. Yeah. I, I will say most of the people who deploy C groups are accustomed to this. Yes, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. This is not a new problem with no. C groups, and so 
like you know they have methods. They, oh yeah, you know that's gone wrong. We, yeah. we need to tweak. Like because currently if we don't do that, it's very pretty, uh, very easy for us to now just fix the the GPU memory being allocated to the CPU thing. And yeah. It's the same as the, probably the Android problem. But at the moment, it could, sometimes it comes in the wrong place. But if we fix that, it would probably blow up a lot of existing. Right, but yeah, like that know, happens all the time. time. Yeah, but so I'm taking used to it. I suppose that's. Yeah. It's, it's a loop. If you're using system memory, you're using system memory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You want to have some finer grain accounting on that, too. Yeah. So you want to know, like, it's not just CPU memory, but this is GPU. Yeah, you'd like to know that. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it should, it should show up as your driber. Right. So that's having that. Doesn't kind of, the C group already kind of do that for you? Uh, so is it a, I I mean, if your driver goes and says, I want this much from the C group, then it should show up. But it's not going to count yeah. against the process, right? Okay. It's just it's that the process used this much memory. Mm -hmm. And the part for us is that you know, Graloc is doing that allocation and then passes that off to another process. And so we want that, the process to get charged. Yeah. And so we transfer the charge to the binder. And at that point, we still want to have a little more rep, like granularity on, you know, it's not just system memory, but it's, you know, system, system memory for graphics. System <laughs> memory for graphics. And, yeah, so how do you think? Would be a good way oh. to see that. Well, so could, could be, could be like, since we talked anyway about like splitting enforcement from accounting, right? Perhaps we could start with the accounting, which does like track just GPU memory and maybe then some subgroups with device GPU memory. And, the, and right. then for system, when we go to enforcement, we say system memory is not going to be enforced by the GPU tracking thing. It's it's going to get tracked on the main CG. Mm. And then full state. That's because yeah. everything else doesn't make sense because it's the same box. So it's right? a tiny little hierarchy. You've got yeah. GPU and then. But it's still the accounting. Still yeah, accounted in two places, but enforced. It, it will be accounted yeah. in two yeah. places, but enforced. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's how it works. No, I don't know. That would be nice. Sorry. <laughs> C groups control it. But only do the enforcement for like the GP device memory and stuff. Yeah, that is really enforced by memory issue. That and that and as a side effect, you're able to see that it's allocated for the GPU. Yeah. But do you want and, to? And, and I guess we also would need some of that for like migrating stuff around, probably, so that you can limit the overall, right. uh, the, the, the overall GPU memory usage, irrespective of where it is. Yeah. So do you want the actual like system memory enforcement would be sorry, you like, can't allocate system memory. Wouldn't you want so, to maybe? So do we want to account the system memory that we use on migration, like when we swap up on over subscription over subscription of device? Well, yeah, memory? I mean if you use it, use it. It counts. It doesn't matter. The fact so, that it's but how do we? And we and later do we want to enforce that also? So at, I at won't. At some have point, one. at some point, people are asking us to enforce all of this stuff, right? They, they I want, mean, the, the migration problem is really interesting. But no, especially once we started enforcing. Honestly, conceptually, it doesn't seem that hard. I know we get bike shitted about you know what goes where, but really, you got device memory, and then you got system memory, and sometimes you ask for more device memory, so you overflow to system memory. But in the end, you have a limit. You know, you're allowed to use eighty percent of device memory, and you're allowed to overflow to twenty percent of system memory. I mean, you just need a name system that supports that. It doesn't seem that hard. Well, it's, it's more like what happens when you when you try to evict somewhere and the place you want to put it to also doesn't have space. Right. So well, then, then, then your evict fills, which means that you're going you to go bits. over your device memory yeah. limit, which but means the that your application is, fills. You have two applications. One of them like just focus on strapping device memory. Right. And then the other one will say, I want to use this. So you evict memory from the first application. But the but no one send it. first application, like it doesn't have any space anymore. But you, do you just go ahead and kill that one despite that it kind of started running and it seems to have Well, I mean, each one's going to have, I suppose you, you've got. It, it gets interesting what the exact It does, because there's two types of oversubscription, right? There's one where the, the single process asks for more than is installed, and there's one where you have multiple processes finally. But collectively, yes. also more than and, and that's where the C groups can really help, because you can say, well, you know, in this C group, you're, uh, you're allowed to use, you know, 50% of the of the device memory and, you know, 50% of the system memory. In that case, the two would not thrash. But if you allow both of them to have 60%, then you're going to see some thrashing as they kick each other I, off. I, I don't think, like, it's very hard for me to see how 
C groups, like people who want to use C groups and people who want to do oversubscription of device memory are the same people. Like, oh, no, yeah, it yeah, looks to me like conflicting things. No, no, no it's the same people. Because, why? Yeah. C yeah. groups over subscribe why C memory yeah. exists. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. No, but why? why? But why? Hey, you no, know? because so, hey, the, two, the whole process case is very hard. If you say, well, I've got this process and I want to use all the memory plus oversubscribe, and then I've got another process that also wants that, what you get is thrashing, and then depending on how well you write your driver, it may be reasonable thrashing or it may be really yeah, so But the C of groups, I can specify, I can say, you know what, each one of these little guys gets 40% of device memory and 40% of system memory, and now I don't, I don't get thrashing. Yeah, but if they're running a workload that counts on the oversubscription feature, then it just won't work for them. That's what the limits mean. Yeah. <laughs> you got to watch better limits. That's what limits right. mean. You see, when you try uh, to allocate that much, it fails when you... So you have to put the yeah. system memory in a, a higher C group level so that they can share each system memory. Thanks, everyone online. Yeah.